Hey guys, I'm Max Scoville here for Rev3 Games, and I'm at the Assassin's Creed 3 preview event with Corey May, who is the lead writer. Thank you for being here. Thank um, you for having me. Number one burning question that you guys have completely steered clear of. What's up with Desmond? All I can say is that, uh, as with all previous AC games, AC3 will begin exactly where the preceding game, Revelations in this case, ended. And uh, when Revelations ended, Desmond and crew had arrived at what is called the, the Final Temple, the Grand Temple, the place where hopefully all of their questions will be answered and the solution to the upcoming apocalypse will hopefully be found. And uh, that's all I can say at this point in time. And then suddenly, Ben Franklin and Native Americans. Uh, yes. There you go. Um, so with my time with the game, I was thrown into sequence six, which is very much in, the, in kind of the middle of things, yep. and um, the middle of things being uh, the Boston Tea Party. And how does this uh, how does this play into things? So there's always a balancing act, right? So um, we try as much as possible to be inspired by history, to stick as close to facts as we can, to be as accurate as we can. We have internally what we call a 30-second rule which is uh, when confronted by a question, whatever the, the answer is that you can find within 30 seconds of going online is, that that's what the game should at least try and respect. Um, at the same time, fun has to come first. The experience for the player has to come before historical accuracy. So if there are moments where what is historically accurate isn't fun, we will tweak or condense or, or slightly spin things. Uh, Assassin's Creed isn't meant to be a replacement for an education in history. It's, it's meant to inspire you to go out there and learn more. I don't, I don't want people to think that we are uh, trying to uh, create a documentary here. We want to create a world that, that feels credible, um, that feels plausible, so that when crazy stuff does happen with the assassins, when we introduce the conflict with the Templars, that it feels like, okay, maybe this could have happened. Maybe this actually is, is the way events occurred. And we try and obviously provide a, a fictional spin onto how and why events are occurring. In our game, for example, the, the Boston Tea Party, at least as far as Connor is concerned, is an attempt to stop a Templar conspiracy. Um, to say more would be to spoil stuff, but he is not, uh, contrary to popular belief, joining the Patriot Army and heading out there to attack British. Yeah. He is fighting Templars. I thought that was kind of neat, as opposed to just having him be like like the secret agent of the you know right. of the Colonials. He's actually got kind of a, a, an agenda of his own. Yes. So the idea is that, as with all Assassin's Creed games, he is locked in this conflict with the Templars, and this conflict will take him through the events of the American Revolution. The American Revolution happens in the back and there are touch points at events with certain individuals um, and so there's a, a blending but we wanted to focus on the on the Templar assassin war and then let uh, the revolution be the stage against which this drama plays out. Connor, take care. These men are powerful. What would you have me do? I made a promise to my people. So as you were uh, as you were researching for the game was there any any stuff that kind of that came up for you that struck you as interesting? Yeah, there were a lot of instances I found where what actually happened differed, um, not always substantially, but, but m enough to make it interesting from the way that events are recounted. For example, I think that when people think of uh, the midnight ride of Paul Revere, they imagine this guy riding through the countryside from Boston all the way to Concord shouting, the British are coming, the British are coming. And the reality of the situation is, you know, substantially different. Uh, he was there, he did ride, but he didn't make it all the way. He was accompanied by other people and he was at one point captured and released. Oh, damn. Uh, another thing is that uh, there's a major battle that occurs during the American Revolution known as the Battle of Bunker Hill. Uh, it actually had almost nothing to do with Bunker Hill. There were very minimal fortifications built on Bunker Hill. The Patriots were mainly set up on another hill right next to it called Breed's Hill, and the Loyalists were set up on a third hill known as Molten Hill. And at the time, they actually referred to it as the Battle for Breed's or the Battle of Breed's Hill, and it's just over time, it morphed into the Battle of Bunker Hill um, for various reasons, probably one of which cooler. is it sounds cooler yeah. than the Battle of Breed's Hill. Well, that's the thing is everyone, you know, at least growing up in America, you get the, the American Revolution taught in history. It's, yep. it's very often kind of spun into this sort of fairy tale propaganda yep. of, of things. But, uh, you know, in reality, there's a lot more going on. Uh, propaganda was actually a, a big part of the revolution. We, uh, we discovered that shortly after the uh, opening salvos of the Revolutionary War that were fired in Lexington, there's this idea of the shot heard around the world, the, the opening shot. No one knows who fired it. After these battles had occurred, there was discussion back in Congress uh, at the time amongst the, uh, the Patriots as to uh, ensuring that they got the word out that it was in fact the Loyalists that fired first. For one, it would increase sympathy. It would make it seem as though the Patriots were defending themselves against an aggressor. And number two, should things not go well and they find themselves captured by the enemy and, the, and this nascent revolution quash before it could really begin, 
they, they wouldn't be uh, you know, uh, charged with treason. Because again, if they were firing in self-defense, yeah. it's self-defense and there's an it, argument. You know? But if they fired first, it's treason. And so you see even back then, people are trying to find ways to get the message out that no, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys, we're just trying to defend ourselves. And you know, it's, it's really interesting to see those processes begin and, and develop you know, as, as far back as the American Revolution. And you get the opportunity to put those in the game, too. Yes, and That's to play with them, right? We don't want to, to uh, take a specific side, per se, when it comes to that, right? The, the Loyalists, the, the British Empire, had reasons for, for doing what they did. It wasn't just this mad king sitting on a throne, you know, demented and, and all-powerful, demanding, like, I, I need the entire universe to serve me. And so we wanted to play with that. Um, and we wanted to, to make sure people knew that there were reasons that, that both sides were acting that the, the way they did. And of course, you've got the, the Templars and Assassins to throw yes. in there too, make it nice and interesting. Yes. And then at the very bottom of it, there's... And we definitely play with that. So I, I think what people, the way people expect those divisions to, to come about, um, well, I say play the game and, and, and see what actually happens. Very cool. Yep. You've, got, uh, you've also got interactive conversations here. Yes. So um, sometimes you will have the opportunity to talk to certain characters in the game sort of off the, the main path and engage in, in, in longer dialogue with them. And for us, this was a way to strike a balance between people that really want to just go, 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 go and keep the pace like super fast and then allow people that want to dig a little bit deeper, get to know characters a little bit more, you know, slow down the pace a bit to get steeped and immersed in stuff to have the opportunity and the chance to do that. So we're trying to cater to both types of players in this instance. That's cool. Let's add some flavor to it. Yeah. So, Assassin's Creed 3, that's coming out October 30th for PS3 and 360? That is correct. Very cool. And it's full of fun and surprises, you said? It is full of lots and lots of fun and surprises. You guys have done a pretty good job keeping, keeping a lot of this under wraps, so... We're trying. Be interesting to find out more. And you can find out more at home by checking out the rest of our videos right here on this channel, Rev3 Games. I'm Max Scoville. I will see you guys around.